Okay, let's wrap up week two um, with part five of the materials, which are going to cover some issues around thread safe collections, which are available in the Java collection. Let's think about two threads sharing a linked list, which is an, has an explicit size value. Let both threads try to add an element to the list at the same time. They read the size value, one of them adds an element, writes the new size back, the next adds its element and writes the size back, and it overwrites the size that was written back previously by the first thread. This is a classic race condition. So the size variable and the number of elements in the list need to be synchronized, otherwise the, the structure will be corrupted. So this gives you an example of why we need uh, thread safe access to all of our structures um, in our programs. Now, interestingly, none of the Java util collections are thread safe, except for the vector and hash table, which is a legacy reason from Java 1.0, if I remember correctly. And so all the, the collections you know and love are not safe to use in your multi-threaded programs. And the reason for this is very simple. Uh, synchronized methods are much slower than non-synchronized methods um, because you have to, there's overheads incurred with, with acquiring the monitor lock. So if you need to have thread-safe collections in your programs, in your multi-threaded programs, you almost certainly do, then you've got two options. You can either, first of all, build yourself a custom wrapper that has synchronized methods, and these are then delegate to the underlying collection methods to, to uh, manipulate the data structure. Or Java provides this um, static method for the collections um, class, so you can create a synchronized version of any of the um, packages, any of the, the, the collections in the Java util package. So here we are creating a list which behaves just like a normal list, except what's happening here is that the there's basically a synchronized wrapper being generated for you by the collections classes. So this then is thread safe to access. So that's always an option and, and less error prone, I guess, than the first one. Still, these synchronized wrappers will still incur the performance penalty that you have with, with synchronization. This is acquiring the monitor lock, and then all of the access to the underlying data structures is serialized, so only one thread can access the, the data structure at a time. And if we make a modification, then the whole structure is locked, so again, only one thread can, can make a modification. And if you remember back to last week's lecture, what about Armdell's law? This is basically an area where your code is serialized, making modifications to your synchronized um, data structures. So in this case, we are serializing our code, which is limiting its concurrent performance uh, potential. For this reason, Java 5 incorporates the java.util.concurrent package like packages. And this is a, an excellent collection of classes that are specifically designed for, for efficient use in multi-threaded programs. So let's take a brief look at some of these. Um, we'll go over examples of these three. Um, the blocking queue, concurrent hash map, in fact, and a copy on write array list. So all of them are designed to be used in, thread safe, in a thread safe manner in your multi-threaded programs. So a hash map behave, the concurrent hash map behaves just like a hash map, except it's actually divided by default when you create one, you can modify this into 16 segments. And a lock is applied to each segment within the underlying data structure. They're called buckets. What this means is that when you, when you hash into the collection, you'll hash into one of the underlying buckets. And that bucket is then locked if you're making a modification. Uh, this means that only that bucket is locked for modifications and other buckets can be accessed concurrently. So we can have up to n concurrent updates occurring across this hash map, uh, where n is the number of buckets that we have divided the structure into. So this is great because it allows safe concurrent modification, increases the amount of concurrency we can have in our code. Not everything is serialized 
making updates to the hash map. So this is what it looks like roughly. We have um, the hash buckets, buckets here, which would be individually locked. So writes can occur at, at each bucket um, concurrently. So in this example, we have four writes occurring at the same time. So concurrent hash map has all of the uh, operations you know and love, and uh, things like remove and replace are guaranteed to be atomic and hence be safe in a multi-threaded environment. Other operations have what is known as relaxed consistency. Let's take an example of an iterator. When I ask for an iterator on a concurrent hash map, I'm guaranteed to get the contents to iterate over the contents of the hash map at the time of the iterator's creation. I may or may not see um, elements of the hash map which are added or removed um, after I've created the iterator. So I get a, a, a guarantee of seeing a version of the, the underlying data structure, but not necessarily the latest version. By having this relaxed consistency, it enables us to to have more efficient access to the to the underlying data structure without perhaps always getting the latest contents. Blocking queues are great things. Um, if you think back to the producer consumer problem we talked about in the previous um, section, then we had to use wait and notify and it got quite complicated. Blocking queues simplify the producer consumer style pattern really, really nicely. Basically, they're just a structure where you are guaranteed to, if you want to put an element into the queue, um, it will work unless there's no space. And when in, there's no space available in the queue, then you wait exactly the opposite on the consumer. Then you retrieve an item. And if there's no items to retrieve, then you block. Really, really simple and perfect for our producer consumer problem. Let's look at the code. Again, compare this to the previous example and you'll find it's so much simpler. We have a producer thread and a consumer thread, or runnable, sorry. They each get past um, a reference to the queue, and they just go around in a loop. The producers put items onto the queue, and the consumers take items from the queue. To set this up, we just create ourselves a linked blocking queue in this example. There's two or three implementations of the blocking queue interface, if I remember correctly. And then we pass this to the producer and the consumer runnables and then start them. And that's all we need to do. Here we have one producer and two consumers and the consumers will, will randomly retrieve the messages um, put on the queue by the producer. So which consumer gets the messages is not determined. It depends on exactly um, which, ones, which one's calls reach the blocking queue first. And that's all managed by the JVM, so completely non-deterministic. So blocking queues are great, and um, I expect you'll be using them in the assignment, so pay attention to this one. Copy on write array lists are another interesting uh, data structure. These are essentially a thread-safe version of an array list, and they have this interesting property whereby mutator methods create a snapshot of the underlying array. They don't actually make a change to the array, they actually make a copy. This means when a thread gets an iterator on the, on the array, on the array list, it gets its own immutable version of the data structure, which it iterates across. And any modifications subsequently made to that underlying structure are not reflected in the copy that the um, each iterator um, reflects. So this means that reading is very, very fast because you're, you're iterating across an immutable version of the, of the structure. But writes are costly because every write requires you to make a new copy of the underlying data, data structure. So use these with care. They're excellent in situations where you have lots of reads, lots of iterations across your structure, but updates are rare. Because if you think about it, if we have many threads making updates to the structure and many threads iterating over the structure, we're gonna be doing a lot of copying of the complete data structure. And should that data structure be large, this is gonna be very expensive indeed. 
So, in summary, um, from the whole the whole module, concurrency is a fundamental part of, of software systems, especially distributed software systems. It enables us to exploit the underlying resources and capacity of the nodes that we execute on because we have multiple CPUs and we can overlap operations on disk and networks. When we build concurrent solutions, we have to be cognizant of race conditions and deadlocks. And this means we have to make sure our programs are correctly synchronized. And remember that the scheduler is the one that makes decisions on when to run threads based on their state and their priority. And hence your code has to be correct in, in terms of it not, not, make, not containing race conditions or deadlocks, regardless of the order of the operations um, that the, the scheduler chooses. So it's a tricky world that we live in here, but um, it's an essential skill for a software development engineer. Any questions we'll cover in the lecture um, when we meet next week.